بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم في سورة القصص سورة نمبر 28 22 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولما توجه تلقاء مدين قال عسى ربي أن يهديني سواء السبيل ولما ورد ماء مدين وجد عليه أمة من الناس يسخون ووجد من دونهم امرأتين تذودان قال ما خطبكما قالتا لا نسقي حتى يصدر الرعاء وأبونا شيخ كبير موسى عليه السلام had to leave فرعون's uh, palace and had to leave Egypt the only place he knew of where he could go uh, for any kind of refuge and asylum was towards Madian, a very strategic town and city of the old towards the northeast of Egypt. Uh, Musa, being familiar with the history and the geography of uh, Egypt and its surroundings and everything else that he learned, from Firaun and his people in the palace, also knew about people and their civilizations, their weaknesses and their strengths, and so on. So it wasn't that a thought came to Musa, where should I go? And he was inspired, and then he left. He knew this. This was part of his understanding of the world of that time. It was in his geography curriculum. Right? Firaun taught him everything about Egypt, about his empire, his kingdom, about the people around him, who is who, and what they do, what their weaknesses and their strengths are, and so on. So Musa calculated in his mind that the best place for me to go and live and settle in exile and asylum would be Madian, which was a thriving metropolis, even at that time, and very strategic city for economic purposes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when he faced uh, towards Tilqa means towards towards Madian, Madian being the famous town and city of Midian, Musa alayhi salam was making a dua in his heart, in his mind. He is hopeful and says to himself, perhaps my Lord will guide me towards a better path, a path that is in the middle, where I may not be that rich and lavish in my uh, consumption of the world, and I may not be that poor either. So he knew that he was strong, and he had physical abilities. He also knew that he was intelligent, and he had intellectual capabilities, so he, uh, as I said, calculated the best place for him to live, and he found that Madian being a place of commerce and business and economic importance, he would be comfortable living there and finding a suitable style and mode of living there in Madian. This is how you explain the ayah. And Musa Islam's hope that Allah his Lord will provide him something. As Allah his Lord provided him the uh, ability and the uh, opportunity to be raised by the Fir'aun, Allah his Lord will provide him with another ability and possibility. And that is his frame of mind. Okay, that's his understanding. Meaning he did not see himself to be hopeless and totally bereft and totally dejected in the doldrums <coughs> meaning from riches to rags he said no that is not the dignity and nobility of a human being a human being when he is tested does not succumb to the pressures of the test and see himself as a failure okay. first and foremost the human being says Rabbi I still have my Lord. 
yes, this is a test, and I'm now out of the palace, I'm out of Egypt. So what, what worse can happen? So Musa is not negative, and they're not allowed to be negative. Okay. They're not allowed to be pessimistic. It's not possible for a Nabi to be pessimistic. Okay. They always hope that Allah will provide for them. And here Musa al-Islam's hope is calculated. Okay. It's not inspired. Right? Yeah. Meaning the people say that Musa is a Nabi, no, it's calculated. Is that I have strength, I am young, I have physical abilities, I can help, I can earn a living either through my physical strength or I can le- earn a living through my education that I have received. And the education I've received is the best in the world at the hands of the Firaun. So this is what he is uh, referring to, and it is Sawas Sabil, a path that is in the middle of the path and the right road. And this is how Muslims must also view themselves, that if one opportunity fails, then Allah is still there. Another opportunity may be created. If, first and foremost, we have two things. One is trust and belief in Allah, that He is our Lord. And number two, that we look at our strengths and not our weaknesses. What else can I do? We all have many strengths that we have not tapped into. We don't know about them until, God forbid, it is a trial or test. And say, I can't do this anymore, so let me rethink, re-strategize, go back to the drawing board. What else can I do? What else should I be doing, which is halal? <laughs> so here, the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's approaching Madian. So when he approaches the water of Madian, when he comes across the water, meaning a well outside of Madian, which was a watering hole for many people who were on the outskirts and some people who were inside of the city, that uh, people would come, bring their flocks and bring their herds and uh, take water from there to their homes, etc. And a huge congregation of people. Musa a.s. found upon that well uh, a group of people, Ummatam Minnas, a whole nation of people, huge amount of uh, people who were there, Yisqoon, okay, watering their flocks, and their sheep, and their families. وَوَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمْ أُمْرَأَتَيْنِ تَذُودَانِ And beyond them, just aside from them, aloof from all of these people, he found two women who were keeping back their flocks. He were, they were young women, and they were not able to go inside the crowd of the men to water their flock. This, again, because it's al qasas the story in the Quran speaks volumes about how we should behave in society. Number one. Number one is that women in general should not go into the midst of men. Tadudan. So meaning they were keeping their flock and their sheep away from the water. Why? Because there are too many men around the water. So mixing and mingling. It's fun, but it's not allowed. Tadudan, you don't do this. Uh, you repel not only the sheep but also the men. So the Quran doesn't give us the object here in the sentence, the mafool. The Quran just says Tadudan. Who were they repelling? Not just their sheep but also the men because men have a tendency when they see women and say, let's go for them. No, you're not going near us. And we and our sheep, they're not coming near you. We'll wait until you go away so that we can water our flock. <laughs> Musa is then being a noble person, went up to the ladies and said, What's your story? What is your story? <laughs> What's your affair? What's wrong with you? Why are you here, number one, alone? You're not supposed to be alone, you women. Number two, you're not supposed to be doing this, what? 
mm-hmm. taking the sheep and the herd and the flock out, because that is a man's job, not a woman's job. That's what it means when the Quran says, Musa salam, did not approach them to chat with them, or to get a date. Musa doesn't approach them to find out what's your story. Number one, that you are women, why are you here? Number two, you're doing the work of a man. You shouldn't be doing the work of a man. What's your story? He's checking. <laughs> this is nobility. So no harm comes to any other human being. They said that we are not able to provide water to our sheep until all the shepherds have returned and finished their work with their sheep and their herd. That's the first part. The second part to your question, وَأَبُوْنَا شَيْخٌ kabir. So the question is not mentioned here in the Qur'an. The question is understood by the read of the Qur'an that why would Musa even think to approach women whom he knows he is not allowed to speak to? So he's not out of curiosity, he's out of concern. And that's where the nobility comes in. So our father, he's an old man. That's why we're here. And since we are women, we can't go there. So now the uh, two women, they understand Musa salam's question perfectly. And they respond perfectly. And it's how you see the adab of human civilization that when you want to engage in what's known as uh, gender okay, what's it called interaction there should be no interaction unless there's a concern right this is how we see the hayas you will see later on the next time haya next two eyes is the haya the modesty of both the man Musa and the two ladies, and they were young ladies, they were young girls. So we are forced to come out because our father is very old, he's not able to walk this far, and he's not able to take care of the herd. We have a responsibility to fend for our father, fend for ourselves, and whenever we come here, the men are always here, and we have to wait until they go so that we and our sheep can drink and take some water home, etc. So Musa salam being the noble gentleman and also the very strong gentleman, as you heard before, a very strong, powerful man. Fasakalahuma. So he helped them water their flock. He gave their flock water and he said, Okay, let me do this, let me help you. So he went there in front of all the men and they moved them around and say you know, these ladies are entitled to the water just as much as you are. In fact, they're entitled to it more than you are, so let me do this. So, so now Musa alayhi salam's strength, his nobility, his generosity, his concern for human now safety allowed him to do all of this. And then after he did this for them, what did he do? Did he say, let me take you back? <laughs> let me escort you home. He said, we don't need escorts Literally and figuratively, right? Let me escort you back. No, 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 no. He didn't even think about it. He didn't even think about the idea that uh, I, I must finish the job and take these two young girls and their sheep back to their family. No, no. My job is done. Okay? They're more than capable of taking <laughs> the sheep back themselves to wherever they came from. I don't need that. That's not my business. My business is this. Then he found a tree around the uh, neighborhood. As you know, it was a desert. And he went there. He sought refuge underneath the shade of a tree. <coughs> in a dhullil, underneath a shadow, the shadow. Shadows obviously come only when there's a tall object. And the only tall object was a tree. That's how you get the tree there. فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ Then he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, My Lord, indeed, whatever you are going to send to me, or whatever you have sent to me of goodness, I am in need of that. I am a faqir, I am a pauper. I am in need of any good that you send me. So again, this is the adab of a nabi, 
that after helping people, and after you've finished helping people, you turn to Allah, and you ask Allah to help you, not those people who, whom you helped, as what? A favor. <coughs> this was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ very early on. وَلَا تَمْنُنْ تَمْنُنْ تَسْتَكْثِرْ In Surah Al-Muddathir, uh, Allah subhanahu wa says to the Prophet ﷺ in the second revelation, that do not do favors in the hope that you will increase now yourself in the dunya. So when you're doing somebody a favor, then you must stop at the favor you've done. You must not imply upon the person that you want something else from the person whom you have now helped. That is not ikhlas. That is not sincerity. So the Prophet Sallallahu when he did favors to anybody, he never assumed that they will repay him further down the line somewhere. You owe me. <laughs> Likewise, Musa said, they don't owe me anything. I don't need anything from them because I did the deed because it's my nobility, my generosity, that's who I am, what I am. Okay. So prophets do not expect a return of gratitude in kindness from anyone whom they encounter. The standard of sincerity for prophets, alayhi salam, and they are all human beings. The prophets, they're not simple human beings. So we must not assume because they're prophets, they're able to do this. No, we can do this too, if we put our minds to it and our hearts in it. Musa alayhi salam is now alone. He's in the desert. He has water, and he can drink from the well, and he has helped somebody, and he didn't ask anything from them. He turns towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am in need of anything that you send me in, good, in goodness, in khayr, in any kind of goodness you send me now, I am in need of that. I will need you to help me and assist me and so on. This is the abadiyah, uh, the servitude of all the prophets, alayhi wa sallam, that they see anything good that comes to them is from Allah, not from their own efforts. So they do not ascribe their efforts to any goodness that comes to them. They say, هَذَا مِنْ فَضْلِ Rabbi. This is from the fadl of my Lord, not from my actions. So they separate Allah's fadl from their actions. They don't see the results of their actions as their results, which is a, a lesson in sincerity and also lesson in adab that you don't demand results from Allah hey I make dua he didn't answer my dua what's Allah doing for us today none of that why because Allah is Allah he's God if he did what you want him to do then you would be God and he should be worshipping you not the other way around so you have to say I'm a faqir I'm a pauper, and Allah is al-ghani, the all-rich and independent. Okay. When you have this contrast between the ad, the servant, and Allah, then you have Islam. But if the Muslims demand that there should be results from their actions immediately, and perhaps even in this world, then they're not worshipping Allah, they are worshipping their actions. That's the difference between what the prophets did and the Sahaba did, and what we do. So we perform for the sake of Allah. The results are consequential. Sometimes the results will come, and sometimes the results may not come. Musa al-Islam, being trained by his mother, knows that I can't demand anything from Allah. I may ask. So he doesn't demand, he asks. Allah, I'm in need of anything that you send me. إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds almost instantaneously without Musa Hassan anticipating any favor from those two girls. فَجَاءَتُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِيَ عَلَى اسْتِحْيَا Then all of a sudden one of the two girls came to him and she was walking out of modesty. Okay. Shyly, عَلَى اسْتِحْيَا That when uh, people walk, and especially women, 
that they should have haya and shyness and modesty in them so that they do not draw and attract attention from others towards them that people who look at them should not turn their heads to look at them a second time al right. this is the modesty that the Quran is depicting for us to understand what is the modesty of Musa which has been confirmed in the previous ayah and now the modesty in these girls that how their father whose name people say is Shaib not the Nabi but another person by the same name he raised these two girls with modesty in modesty with these ethics and morals that number one they are able to do the work of a man but they did not strip themselves of the dignity of women can you have that combination can I be a dignified person a woman and be modest and still do the work of a man if there's a need to not because I want to but there's a need my father we have to fend for him he has no son there's nobody there he's an old man and he needs food and drink and we have this stock in the form of sheep we are forced to work but since we are forced to work shall we become so shameless that we behave like men amongst men so the Quran confirms no. why? because the wife of a Nabi must be as pure as the Nabi himself. Right. Illa man Allah, except for Nuh's wife and Lut's wife. Two exceptions. But here, Musa alayhi salam, uh, since he was raised by his mother, and this girl, one of the two that was raised by this person, Shraim, now brings about to all of mankind this reality that sometimes when women must do the work of men they do not need to strip themselves of the feminine modesty so even the way she walked was with modesty not with vanity that I want people to notice me she was walking very shyly as Pickthorpe translates correctly shyly very shyly I don't need to meet you or come to you. And I'm very shy about it. My father is sending me. And because my father is commanding me to come to you, I'm obeying his command, not because I want to. Honest is now the way forward for Muslims of today that when they uh, promote and propagate the work ethics of Muslims, anywhere in the world, they must promote honest these two words, upon modesty and shyness that I really don't want to be in the face of men. I don't want to look at them. I don't want to talk to them. It's just out of mere necessity that I'm doing this. Qalat in the Abi Yad'uqa. First and foremost, she apologizes why she is there. She says, indeed, my father is calling you. I'm not calling you. <laughs> I'm not here because I want to meet you. I'm here per the command of my father, and he wants to invite you. Why? لِيَجْزِيَكَ أَجْرَ مَا سَقَيْتَ لَنَا To pay you for the favor you did us in watering our flock. So he wants to give you money for the work you did. Meaning, watering a whole herd of sheep is an arduous task. It is a man's job. It takes time, effort, strength, and everything. So the Shaib being very noble and trustworthy, as you will find out. Uh, he doesn't want a favor from a stranger without any compensation. Such is the nobility of human society. These values are there in few people, but not in civilization. This used to be a civilizational value. All of these values, modesty, honesty, trustworthiness, and paying people back for their uh, services, this always used to be part and part of human civilization. Uh, we can reintroduce them. There's no harm in saying we can reintroduce them. There's a hope there. So we just have to read them. This is, this is why this is the story. Al-Qasas. It explains life. 
Right? Every ayah explains life. This is al Qasas, the story. So it's not a story how he helped a few women do this and he was now given the, the, the daughter as in, in marriage. That is too simplistic for us. It's an insult against the Quran to mention the story in those words. Read every word and read every ayah and see how it explains life. This is ajrama he wants to pay the wage for what you gave us in water. This is the tradition of human beings. This is where the word comes in the surah. And then when he came to him, Musa came to this person known as Shu'aib and uh, narrated a whole story. His whole story from the time he was born until this time when he meets Shaib, this is the story. Shaib, being an elderly person, said, Don't fear. Why? That although you're no longer in the palace, you have been delivered and rescued from the oppressive people, the oppressive nations, the nations that are tyrants and so on. So Shaib, being the wise man, is now showing Musa alayhi salam one of the hikmahs and the wisdom behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him out of there. He said, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken you out from there is because he wants to save you from that tyranny and from those people who are tyrannical and oppressors. And this is a favor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you, O Musa. And you must appreciate this meaning that you should see the silver lining. Be positive about this part of your story. The first part of your story until recently it was tremendous and it was mind boggling. Uh, it was a miracle that you, first of all you survived and second of all that the Firaun who wanted to kill you raised you. In the second part of your story where you had to escape, that is also part of Allah's Fadl. So every part and episode of your life you must spin as Allah's Fadl as long as you have not committed a sin. That's the uh, disclaimer. That's the caveat. That if we see episodes in our lives that are up and down, and they go this way and that way, as long as we have not committed a sin, we should find a silver lining and find a positive spin on it. And this is Allah's fault, Alhamdulillah. Had I not done this, maybe I've done this. Had this not happened, maybe something else would have happened. Oh, yeah, Allah subhanahu has given me something else yeah, as a replacement for this and now yeah, battle of this and so on. So as long as we are not negligent and as long as we have not sinned, we should always find a positive hikmah in why Allah has done what he has done to us at this point in life. And you will find so many inspirational thoughts. The key is to be positive about Allah, that Allah is your Lord. He is raising you, He is training you, He is giving you adab and discipline, that He is God and you are not. You are the servant, you are His slave. So He controls everything in your life, that's His prerogative. What is the benefit for me in this? This is the benefit that I may have done this, I could do this and this. So Shaib is teaching Musa, who is not a Nabi yet, the discipline adab of how to think about what Allah has done for him in the latter part of his life thus far. He's still a young man. He's still a young man. Yes, you were in the palace and you were in the riches and so on. But now you are saved from that tyrant and those people. When this is happening, the two girls are listening into the conversation between the two men. One of them says, قَالَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا يَا أَبَتِ اسْتَأْجِرْهُ One of the two women, they say, O oh father, or oh my father, اسْتَأْجِرْهُ okay, Why don't you employ him and hire him as your helper? Now, you look at the insight and the foresight and the intelligence of these ladies. إِنَّ خَيْرَ مَنْ اسْتَأْجَرْتَ الْقَوِيُّ I mean, because the best person whom you can hire is the one who is, number one, strong, okay, physically efficient, and able, al-ameen, and who is trustworthy and honest in his character, in his ethics, and his behavior. Okay. So they saw both. 
How did he see the strength? He was able to do what he did with those people and with the flock and the sheep and so on. And then Al-Amin, but he never came after us. Nor did he ask us for any money. So the Amana is there and the Quwa is there. So when you're going to employ somebody, he must be capable of one, number, number one, doing the job and number two, being honest about al Quwa and Amana. Again, these are the same two Sifat of Jibreel alayhi salam. In Allah Rasul Kareem, the Quwatin عند ذي العرش أكين مطاع ثم أمين. Meaning, when a person is going to deliver uh, a message to all of mankind, number one, he should be able to do it. He should have the ability, either physical, academic, intellectual, spiritual, whatever, ability to perform the task. Number one, number two, he should have the amana. He should be honest about it, and he should be able to perform within the ethics of the job. So this young girl is seeing, saying to her father, who has already shown how wise he is in front of Musa by saying that you have been saved from the tyrants. So Shai is already wise, her father. Now she's saying that you have taught me wisdom, and from that wisdom, hikmah, that you have taught me, I see this man to be a qawi, and I see this man to be al-Amin, and he's the best person you can hire, because you need help. Uh, why? Because we can't do the job as has been proven today. Right. So you need a man. So hire him. Shahid now is saying, Tala, inni uridu anunkihaka ihda ibnatayya hatayni. That I need then to understand how I'm going to execute this. How am I going to hire you when you are going to be now nan mahram for my two daughters here? I can't hire you. Right? Because if you're here and they're here, then you can't be together. That was an emergency, what you saw at the watering hole of Madian outside of the city. That's an emergency, that's a contingency. For contingency will allow one off thing. But if you're going to be here 24 7, then I can't have you because that is not within human civilization that you allow a stranger in your house when you have a daughter, two daughters in your house. That's calling for what? Trouble. That's calling for trouble. See, the Qasas, the story, teaches you life. The discipline of life. This nan mahram is here, and I'm here. Why am I here when the nan mahram is here? Because the Prophet said the third person is the devil. So Shaib who's not a Nabi, now he's saying that, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> if I'm going to hire you, that means I have to marry you to one of them. You can't marry two sisters, right? That's against the Sharia too. Right. He said, why didn't you just marry both of them? You can't marry two sisters, the same person, at the same time. Because that's haram. Having the guy living in the house at the same time as well, that's also haram. So the only thing that can happen is I married you to one of them. You understand the ethical link between what the girl is saying and what the father responds to. The father concedes, okay, I need to hire him. But how am I going to execute this? What are the logistics by which this is going to be possible? I have to get you married to one of them. Once I get you married to one of them, the second one becomes haram on you, and you will have your own house outside of my house, and you will do it together. Known as what? Human discipline. Basic human discipline. But they thought about it, and the Quran narrates it in the story. We don't think about it. It happens after. There's no big deal. Okay. So I want now to marry one of my two daughters here, Hatini. On a condition. So now Shai, being the father and the wali, says, I want a prenuptial here. I want a prenuptial. What's the prenuptial? That you're going to serve me and work for me for eight years. Or, if you want, ten years. That's your mahar, basically. That uh, you will now employ yourself to me and hire yourself to me for eight years, hijaj meaning years. فَإِنَا تَمَامْتَ عَشْرًا فَمِنْ عِنْدِكَ And if you were to complete ten, then that will be a favor from your side. That will be honorable thing for you to do. 
I don't want to cause you any harm or trouble or grievance or any kind of uh, discomfort. And that is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Satajiduni inshallah min salihin You will find me that I will be a good man. Meaning I will not taunt you, I will not shout at you. First of all, I'm old and weak, so I don't have the physical energy left. The majority will be very happy that one of my daughters at least is married to somebody who is kind and generous and strong and he has security to offer to my daughter. Number three, that uh, my flocks and my herd and my uh, livestock will be taken care of so my other daughter will also have a share in that. He's thinking all of this yeah, as he's speaking. And they're, they're, they're communicating by this telepathic ability to understand each other because that's how the society was. That's how the civilization used to be. That this is what you do, and this is what you say. Satajiduni, inshallah, I will be, inshallah, from those who are righteous and good people, that I will treat you kindly as a son in law, I will treat you kindly as a partner in the business, I will treat you kindly because you're taking care of my daughter, I will take, treat you kindly because you're taking care of the assets of my other daughter. Because that's also in the equation. Musa Islam in turn says that is wonderful. I could not have figured in my imagination how Allah would provide me with goodness. Min khayrin. Any goodness instantaneously. Right, as I uh, came and uh, sat underneath the tree, I made a dua, Allah, I need some khair and goodness from you, I'm a faqir. And Allah gives me this, more than khair. He gives me a wife, He gives me livestock, He gives me a home. He gives me a father-in-law, he gives me a sister-in-law, he gives me everything. This is very kind of you. This is between me and you, meaning I accept your terms and conditions for the mahr. In either one of the two terms, if I finish, then there will be no transgression on me. I will not feel that I've been um, treated unjustly if I finish ten or if I finish eight. This is something within my grasp, and it is within reason. Wallahu uh, ala man wakil. Allah is indeed a wakil, an agent, an advocate of whatever we say. Our agreement is here in front of us. So we have now this agreement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an agreement with you and your daughter. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, gives us the story of Musa alayhi salam before he becomes a nabi. This is all before Nabuwa. So before prophets are given Nabuwa, uh, they must show and demonstrate they uh, have the ability to uh, not only understand uh, human beings, but also to take care of them. As the Prophet ﷺ himself said, مَا مِن نَبِيٍ إِلَّا وَقَدِ اسْتَرْعَى غَنَمًا Every Nabi has always uh, done some sheep herding. Every Nabi, every Nabi has gone through this practice of taking care of sheep. Why sheep and goats? Because you will always find that one sheep will be right at the front and another sheep will be right at the end and one will be going this way. How do you manage all of these personalities? Right? Differentiation in education and teaching is one thing. Differentiation in human beings, eh, it's only a different ballgame. Only a Nabi can do that. Only the Nabi has the resilience, the uh, patience, the perseverance, and the dua and the trust in Allah that he can take care of a flock of human beings. Eh, no one else can, because no one else has that patience. Or before that, they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the know-how and they simply don't know uh, where they're going to be angry and how to be angry and when to be angry and when not to be angry. <laughs> the sheep have a personality of their own, like all animals, right? How do you manage you know, animals who have their own personalities? You can't say, hey, look, follow the rules. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do in front of a flock of sheep? Are you going to read the U.S. Constitution? These are the laws. Follow these laws. 
It is not about law. It's about understanding the different uh, the potential, uh, what do you call it, misgivings of human beings. Uh, human beings will have misgivings. They'll have mistakes and possible. You've got to keep all of them together. Okay, so that one doesn't go astray. And number one, number two, that the one who's going fast is slowed down and the one who's going slow is now speeded up. How do you do all this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salatu salam to Madian so that he would learn how to manage sheep. How many years? Ten years. Right? So if you want to lead the ummah, go and manage sheep for one month. No, ten days. Even the Prophet, our Prophet used to graze camel in Mecca of his uncle, Abu Talib, right? Why? Because of this. Because they have their own nature, they have their own personality. They're not going to listen to laws and rules and regulations. <laughs> They'll do what they want to do. How do you keep them together and how do you keep them on the straight path? That only a Nabi can do. Okay. A non-Nabi cannot do that. It is impossible. So therefore, no organization or group other than perhaps the Isa, Islam, and Mahdi, when they come, can claim that they will take care of all the affairs of the Allah. And then the Khulafa Rashid The first four Khalifas. They could have made that claim, but they didn't. Other than that, you're not going to find anybody who is going to be the be or end all for the whole of Ummah at the same time, in the same period. Why? Because we just have not only too many different sheep, we have too many different types of sheep, and too many different types of flocks, and too many ty- different types of topography, and landscape, and geography, and climate, and language, and culture, and emotions, sentiments, all of that human stuff that comes along in human beings. Well, there's a solution for the Ummah. No, no, no. You're not the solution for the Ummah. So be quiet. Your solution is you go and raise a cow or a goat uh, or a sheep for Qurbani five days before and be with that sheep for five days and make friends with it for three days or five days. <coughs> the Sunnah is two months, right? Then after you have befriended that animal, then shed the blood. See if it's good. How does it feel? You'll feel immense pain. Immense pain. Now, people who have cats, what happens to them when their cat dies? They are depressed. For days, for weeks, for months. Why? Because of their attachment to that animal. So, in the Sunnah of the Prophet, he told the Sahaba, if you really want to experience the Qurbani of Ibrahim, go make friends with that animal as your pet your domesticated pet, then as your pet sacrifice. Right? So now these the, are the people who go around today saying that we need uh, this solution for the Ummah, that we must kill everybody in the world. Yeah. Find someone to love and then see how easy it is not to kill that person. Never mind person. Do it an animal first. Do it with the sheep first. That's your qurbani. When you have no attachment with human beings, then you can say, let's kill all human beings. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa, Islam, oh, never mind Fir'aun and the palace and the glory and the luxury, you know, and all the education, all one side. You, know, you, you climb the ladder and the scale, everything that much on them. But this is the story. You know, we're going to take you out from this situation. We're going to teach you something about human beings. And the way we're going to teach you about human beings, because you haven't learned anything about human beings in the palace. That's not where you learn about human beings. You learn about uh, policies in the White House. You don't learn about people. Where do you learn about people? In the Quran, in the Sunnah, in the Prophets. They teach you what is life. How to deal with life, how to manage life, because life is like sheep. Sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes too fast, sometimes it goes too slow. You don't know what they're accusing. So manage your own life as if you're managing your own herd. 
as an individual microchasm of Nabuwa. That each man, the Prophet is the genius of the Prophet, is the, 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 the super intelligence of the Prophet. Kullukum ra'in. Each one of you is a shepherd, subhanAllah. This hadith you've heard several times from the mouths of many people. Each one of you is a shepherd. Kullukum ra'in. All of you are your shepherds, like you have a herd in front of you. Every one of you is going to be responsible and questioned about your flock. Okay, so now, the servant is a shepherd over the property of his lord and master. And the wife is a shepherd over the honor and dignity and the household of her husband. And the husband is a shepherd over his family. And the king is a shepherd and the ruler is a shepherd over whomever he rules. All of you are shepherds. All of you are responsible. All of you be questioned. How do you do this? By understanding this story, the story. What is the story? That living in luxury and having a good education is not the be-all end-all of life because it doesn't test you about life. It doesn't tell you about life. It doesn't show you what life is. Okay. How do you handle life? This you get from the story. Musa al-Islam and Ahsan al-Qasas, the beautiful story of Yusuf al-Islam and then the seerah of the Prophet This is how you understand life. So, the solution for the Ummah, as I am saying, you may quote me, is that all of us should go and raise some sheep as discipline. It's not easy. I wouldn't be able to do it. My first disclaimer, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> Why? It's not in us. We're just too academic, unfortunately, about Islam today. We don't want the practice of Islam. It's too difficult for us to imagine and fathom what the Sahaba went through when they were actually with people. <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is that this is the story Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in the Quran. So the Quran is full of nasiha, full of ibar and lessons and morals, and we must benefit from that in such a way that is no longer an abstract story that we read in the Quran, mashallah, alhamdulillah, beautiful story, beautiful explanation, beautiful tafsir, blah, blah, blah. No. Let's try and execute, implement it in our lives. And the first way to do it is to understand the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in which he says, all of you are shepherds. Whether you're a slave, a husband, a wife, a daughter, a son, a father, a mother, it doesn't matter. All of you are shepherds. You have responsibilities. Take care of them. Now those responsibilities are like sheep. Each responsibility, sometimes will be fast, sometimes will be slow, sometimes they'll go away, sometimes they'll come back, and you have to take care of them in that way. If you do this, then we'll be understanding the story. From the Qur'an and from the Prophet may Allah give us all tawfiq to do what pleases him the most in this world and also in the world hereafter. Inshallah, jazakumullah khair. We'll see all of you soon. Subhanallah, bihamdi. Subhanakallah, bihamdi. Nashallah, ilaha illa, and then astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs>